Hello and welcome to Weekly MTG, the only show brought to you from inside the building. Uh, today I have two incredible incredibly special guests, especially if you are a longtime player of Magic the Gathering or an art fan or both. Uh, in in the show with me today are Rebecca Gay and Mark Poole, two of the legends of the Magic art scene. And we are going to talk art today. Specifically, uh, both of these two have cards in the Secret Layer Drop series that was announced today. Uh, so we're going to spend time talking with Rebecca and Mark this entire show. If you have questions for them, put them in chat. We're going to go through art, new and old, and hear some stories from these two greats. Um, before we get to that, uh, Let's talk a little bit about that secret layer drop in case you don't know what I'm talking about. So it was announced this morning that we have a new all natural, totally refreshing super drop that has uh, eight different drops in it. And you can see them there. A lot of exciting stuff there. Uh, the two specifically that we are going to be focusing on today are uh, the... Let's show the, there it is, the Artist Series Mark Pool by, you guessed it, Mark Pool, And then the Mother's Day 2021 drop, which has one piece from Rebecca and three other pieces, one of which has a special relationship to Rebecca that we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, you might also notice that the packaging on those looks a little bit different. So... Uh, we talked about this in the announcement this morning, uh, but we, we've heard a lot of feedback on the packaging that comes from the secret layer drops. And so I just wanted to show you the old packaging. So this is the Valentine's Day secret layer drop and the new packaging. So this is uh, it's going to look a little different than this. This is one of the off the line um, first versions of it. But you can see, for example, this is how thick the old packaging is. Two of them are about the same size. Uh, so the new packaging is made from all recyclable paper, uh, except for the plastic card wraps. Uh, we're looking to change that in the future, but currently they are not recyclable. I am going to open up one of these just so you can kind of see what the packaging looked like. The packaging size has been reduced to half the original volume, and it now weighs about 58% 50 what it did before. Uh, and there is 91% less plastic by weight. So... This is, so I kind of open that up. I haven't, I haven't actually opened one of these before. I'm doing it live on air. And do, 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 do. I don't actually even know what's in here or if there are cards in here. So open that up. And it's got the drop series. Oh, looks like it's the foil edition of the Phyrexian Praetor. Do, 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 do. So that slides off. Again, all recyclable. And then it opens up, and it looks like these are test cards and are not the Phyrexian cards. Um, but you can see that's it for packaging. The box, and then a little insert, a little fancy thing, and that's that. So it's a lot simpler. It looks like these are the Bob Ross lands. Oh, that's fun. Um, yeah, so a lot less packaging going into these now. Check it out. That's the way the packaging is going to be uh, moving forward. But of course, we're always looking to make improvements. So uh, stay tuned for any more changes that might be coming. But let's get to the meat of things and spend a little time with Rebecca Gay and Mark Poole. Uh, we are going to kind of, we're going to let each of them highlight their work and we're going to go one by one. So uh, luck of the draw, we're going to start with Mark and we're going to talk through his secret layer drop first. Uh, so if you aren't familiar with Mark, uh, this next image might catch you up real quick. So Mark is the artist behind the original Birds of Paradise, among many others. Uh, he has, of course, the distinctive pool signature uh, in the art which is one of the it's, it's one of the first ways that I ever identified who the artist was for cards because it was a little different back then. Uh, but let's talk through your drop series, Mark. First of all, Mark, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, 
so let's start with uh, so basically we're just the way this is going to work everyone we're just going to go card by card mark's going to tell us about each of these pieces um so we're going to start with the new balance from the secret layer okay. drop series tell us about this one All right yeah well you know i, I did the uh, original balance back in the alpha beta set and uh, that was more of your standard knight holding uh justice scale um so when i got this to redo this one or pick this one to redo i did i had to, on my sketchbook i actually had some my modern style of painting with a you know a really embellished knight and holding stuff and with wings and stuff i said you know let's let's pull it back let me do more of my gallery route which is a little bit more cerebral something else going on so um out of the sketches uh this is the one we picked and uh, I actually get to use my son in this piece. He's he's a dude in the red armor. And uh, hmm. I had to put him in a cart at some point because I had used my daughter, I don't know, eight years ago in the, the cons block. Uh, Mardu Shadow Spear was my daughter. So now I've got both my kids in a card. So they're they're <laughs> both they're both there, you know. So, but yeah, I just want to look at balance and 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 try to go with instead of your straightforward concept about balance and the judicial system or whatever this just mm -hmm. pull it back and make it more personal and make it like about life uh life and death you know dawn and and, and sun setting so but i wanted to also tie in the original scales kind of from the original balance card so that's yeah. kind of what i came up with, with this image here so more of a an inward looking piece very cool. Now, obviously, all of these pieces hold a special place in uh, all these cards hold a special place in magic history and your history with magic. How were they selected? Did you pick them? Did they ask you which cards you wanted to do? Uh, how did that work? Yeah, they gave me a uh, to come up with a handful of cards, and they also gave me a list of, of cards as, as a suggestion. So I kind of looked through them all and I said, well, yeah, I'd love to have done Ancestral Recall again or something, but, you know, <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. So I, I always like balance. I like the, the card and, and the art. So I said, well, let's go with that one. And mm -hmm. I wanted to mix up the other ones because since they were using birds and howling mine uh, kind of things, I said, well, let's, let's, just, do, let's just do balance. Uh, the other two, when we get to them, um, there's a different meaning behind those and why I chose those. But balance, I always wanted to revisit and just do something totally different with it so and try to get out of the normal framework of a magic uh forward card if you know what i'm if you, what mm -hmm. i'm saying there yeah all right let's take a look at the next new piece which is a new interpretation of brainstorm so brainstorm yeah. you know it goes back again to the, you know christopher russ was a good friend uh an old magic friend back in the day and when I used to play a good bit, I still play more for fun now, but uh, I played a lot of blue cards, a lot of blue decks. So I always, you know, Brainstorm was there and I did some blue cards, but I was like, you know, when I looked at the set of, of cards I wanted to pick, I said, this one would be a fun one to do. So let me let me give you my take on Brainstorm. But I got to tie in a personal element to this piece as well. Um, Jeff Bear, who's the, um, for, is, is the uh, model for this one for me, was also Christopher Rush's agent. For many many years hmm. uh, and then he became, he's, he's also mine so this piece kind of ties in a lot of personal history but at the same time I wanted to honor the card and come up with my idea of what a brainstorm would look like so mm -hmm. uh, I went with my you know I always like weird landscape objects that are organic but not so I had to put that in this one um, mm -hmm. but bring the figure what I call a central figure to what I call a magic style card instead of pushing the figures back, which I like to do on my gallery kind of stuff. So more of a forward figure, but the personal ties to this card, uh, you know, it was a nice piece to do it on. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, next up is one of those blue cards that you did do back in the day. Uh, Counterspell. So for this one, this is actually the original art that's being reused in this secret layer. So tell us a little bit about this piece. Yeah, what's funny is I still actually have my all my sketches for this, this early stuff, but I've even got my notebook mm -hmm. when Jesper, the art director at the time, called me, and I remember sitting down and writing down all these cards and which ones I was going to pick, and you know, so when I got this one, I was like, all right, what's 
what's a counter spell? What's I know it's an action. I know whatever. So, of course, we had to get the mullet in. I mean, I was rocking a mullet back then when I had hair. <laughs> but um, so you had to, you know, we got to, we got to, we had to get that. But anyway, I just wanted this guy like fixing to cast some crazy something, and it doesn't happen. And it's kind of mm-hmm. like that. But it's it's a wonky piece, but it's a I don't know. It's a it's an interesting piece. It's it still brings a smile to my face and uh, the fans as well. So it's it's. It's kind of cool seeing it the new border. I wouldn't mind redoing this whole piece as a new image, but uh, it's hard to go back and and change something that's become nostalgic and and try mm-hmm. to recapture that, you know, that energy that yeah. happened back then. But yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, so tell me. I mentioned this at the top of the show, but tell me about your your little signature. It's not so little in the in the lower <laughs> right. That's become pretty iconic for your earlier pieces. You know, in, in your early days as an artist, sometimes you're more concerned on how you're going to sign your name. You see all these other people, <laughs> other artists, and they got these cool signatures or they got these cool symbols and this and that. I was like, cool. Well, there's, it's not fancy. So I couldn't do nothing fancy with it uh, with a lot of script because there's no S's and K's or whatever. So I said, let's just kind of make it block. So that's, that's how I went with it, just signed it pool. Uh, I don't sign my pieces that way anymore, but uh, I did that for, I don't know, probably six or seven years uh, with that original signature. All right. Uh, reminder to everyone, if you have questions for either Mark um, or Rebecca when we get to talking about her art, please go ahead and put them in chat. I'll be writing them down as we go along, and we'll, we'll get to them eventually. Uh, next up, so we already looked at the alpha version of Birds of Paradise. The secret layer drop has a version of it as well, using that old art. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about this iconic piece. Yeah, that one's got a lot of crazy history to it, and it was like when, when I got the original assignment, I got I had island. So I we had two island cards in the original assignment. So I said, all right. So when I did my little doodles, I came up, I was like, well, I just want to put a plain, a plain island there. Let's put birds in this one. The other card I did as an island was Island Sanctuary. It's got a Pegasus in it. And those were mm-hmm. originally my island submissions. And when I sent them in, uh, they were like, no, we don't want any any critters on top of the island. So they just put the art on, uh, not a really a reject thing. It's, they just said, no, nah. they said, so I redid the islands. And when Richard and some other people were looking at it and they saw the um, the art, then they said, well, let's not let it go to waste and let's make it into a card. So that's how Birds of Paradise and Island Sanctuary came about. But it's really, you know, it was just back in those days, I did a lot of airbrushing and just simple concepts with simple colors because on my notes, I still have written, it's like, Keep the art simple so if someone was to hold the card up, they could see it across the table or the next table and, and recognize what card it is without having to really read the text. So a lot of my stuff back then was very just crisp and colors and simple, simple design, basically. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, next up is another classic, uh, also from Alpha, Howling Mine. Yeah, that's another another old. But yeah, that the technique back then was yeah, just airbrush and some some acrylic on top. But again, I was like, "What's a howling mine?" So I kind of almost went with my first visual image. But I had other sketches of it. But so I just mm-hmm. imagined this. You know, I was I've always played D and D and stuff as, as a young guy. But so I always imagine maybe this this thing is it's a trap. Of course, we know it is. But and sometimes on the card, you don't get to see the little eyes, the little frog looking eyes hiding in there. So, and of course, I just like making up ruins and rooms as well. So, but that, that one was, uh, you know, when I didn't have any concept of what a howling mine was. It didn't give us exactly what they did in context to how it was played. So, uh, all mm-hmm. we went off with at that time was just the name. So, which is different from the day when you get code names and you get, you know, different variations so mm-hmm. that's why some of this older this older stuff has its own bizarre interpretations because <laughs> of you interpreted just the name you know yep yeah well i mean i am one of those longtime players and so 
this it, it becomes that is what a howling mine is to me yeah i mean if you think about the name and it draws cards and i don't know that's a little abstract but i that's what i see and that's what i think of as a howling mine even though it's been reinterpreted a few times uh next up we have the other new piece of art from this set uh, and you can actually, people who've been paying attention can see it over Mark's left shoulder. Uh, so this is the Wasteland, and there's a, there's a lot going on here. Tell us about this one, Mark. Yeah, this one, again, I, you know, I wanted to approach each card a little different, um, but when I got this one, I was always still uh, looking through the sketches and stuff. I really wanted to take something from the past, uh, you know, be it uh, Urza's Tower or an Ancestral Recall Temple. Uh, I had had all these sketches that involved those, pieces of architecture as well. But then I had my library because you're know, not going to re, you know, reuse library ever again. So to me, this this piece, as I was working on it, kind of tied in the whole concept of old versus new, uh, you know, just things breaking down happens to everything and everybody. But at the same time, um, as, as an artist and, and the skill set I had back then versus now, you know, if, if you if you and I've really worked hard and tried to push my my style and how I'm doing things now compared to when I was back then. But at the same mm -hmm. time, I looked at it as if I never did push myself and never continued, you know, then your styles just kind of will be so just, just kind of go away. So the permanence of things is very fleeting, even though this obviously took a longer time and as far as geography goes. So this was mm -hmm. more of an internal piece for me trying to convey an emotion to the fans of the old card uh, library. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more of an emotional content piece for me than just a straight up, you know, here's the object and here's what a wasteland is. So. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, yeah, do you want to, um, so is that the original then that's sitting over your left shoulder? That's correct. That's the original. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is that one, I'm sure I'm going to ask this question on behalf of the fans. Is that one that's going to be up for sale at any point? We will. We're, we're thinking about how we're going to approach it. And, uh, so me and Jeff are talking now about how we're going to reveal the, the approach to selling this piece. So, all right. It's a hard one uh, to let so go they, of, but <laughs> I, I believe that and I'm sure it'll make a nice, find a nice home with someone. Um, okay, so that is Mark's drop. Again, you can check that out if you head to secret the Secret Layer website. Uh, you can order that entire drop. There it is. All the Mark Pool classics. Uh, so now let's talk about Rebecca's work. Now, uh, first of all, Rebecca, uh, it's been a while since you've done work for Magic. Uh, how how long has it been? Um. I'm honestly not sure the number of years. Uh, the last thing I had released was the land cards. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say it's over 10 years ago that I did them. Mm -hmm. I think they were held for a little bit before publication. Uh, but it's, I would say, easily a decade. And then it was another, like, six or so years before that since Channel came out. Okay. So, yeah, it's been a while. It's nice to be back. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me on the show. I, I've always um, felt this massive sense of gratitude to um, the, the fans who followed my work and connected to my work, uh, as well as to Wizards and, and uh, Magic for being really forward thinking and, and generous of spirit and how they handled um, credit to the artists. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they were the first companies that, that connected powerful uh, pop culture uh, um, game thing, game items uh, to an artist's name, so that collectors and fans and people playing the game could have a really strong uh, visceral response uh, to the work of a specific artist and get to know their name. And it, it's mm -hmm. a wonderful, a wonderful, important thing. It is it yeah. a worldwide uh, name recognition for a number of artists that. Uh, including myself, who may not have had it otherwise. I mean, I was building my name in comics. People knew me there uh, prior to my getting involved in magic. But um, magic uh, was such an instrumental part. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what made you what made you come back to do some more magic art? 
Well, um, last end of last summer, um, Tom Jencott reached out to me and he said, you know, we're, we've got some stuff and we're giving a lot of creative freedom. Uh, are you interested? And I said, I am. If you're really, if you're interested in really kind of the work I'm doing now, um, things I want to say as an artist, uh, I would be interested in talking to you. Um, because, um, you know, I, I have a lot, a lot of things that I, I want to say as an artist before I, you know, before I, I shuffle off this mortal coil, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I feel like a, a great weight of that in my heart. Uh, and so that mm -hmm. was appealing. For me here. Um, he uh, also came to me with this idea of motherhood. Uh, and he said, will you do something with motherhood? And then he said, well, do you think that your kid might have any interest in, in doing a, a, a version of, of an image uh, to connect to this motherhood idea? And I've always kept pretty far out of my own kids' trajectory in terms of what they want to do. And, and, and as an artist, they're on their own journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, you know, done whatever I could to help any number of individual artists sort of into the industry in whatever way I could, whenever I could, when, when, um, when that opportunity was pre presented to me. But with my kid, I, I stay very far out of it. Um, and so when uh, Tom said, do you think they'd be interested? I said, oh, you can ask them. I, I think the idea is beautiful around motherhood and mother child art connected, um, mm -hmm. but it's entirely up to them. And, uh, and, and so they uh, reached out to Elliot and, uh, and, and they ended up uh, generating a card for the, the secret layer that connects to mine, but it's, it's kind of amazing in the way it does that it wasn't planned. We worked both from our hearts and what connected was kind of incredible. Well, that's great. Well, let's, let's look at your piece and, and their piece. Let's start with mm -hmm. yours. And they're both versions of Mother of Runes. So the, the, the drop itself, the Mother's Day drop, has four copies of Mother of Runes. So this is yours. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us about this one. Um, well, uh, you know, one of the most profound experiences in, in my life uh, has been that of birth and, and motherhood and, and the, the, the roaring uh, power of it, um, the, the fierce, all-encompassing nature of what you feel. Uh, it's, and, and, and oftentimes the, the weight, physical, almost physical weight of responsibility you feel to do honor to this this thing uh, that you are, this creature, this amazing thing you're entrusted with to uh, bring forward uh, and give, uh, help thrive and become their own powerful being. Um, and sometimes it feels um, just, it feels like more than you can bear, you know, uh, the mm -hmm. responsibility of it, it feels bigger than the sum of your parts. Um, and the idea of, of Holding, holding things together and up while, um, you know, while battling your your demons, uh, both external and internal. Um, I think it's a universal thing. It's a universal truth that whether you're a mother or a father, you can relate to. Uh, and uh, I, you know, that. So you know, bringing forward something that felt like a universal truth that even if you're not yet at a place of parenting, you can have the emotional response of being held in somebody's heart and mm -hmm. being the person they champion, you know, uh, or the, the, you know, being on the, you know, being there and then remembering that when you put your head forward into a place where you're going to be there. Um, but there's no greater, there's no greater journey in my life um, than um, the moment I looked at the being that was kind of in the world for the first time and they looked at me with the most incredible alien eyes I had ever seen and I was so deeply and darkly in love in the most complete way that um, you understand you understand something in a way that you just you've never understood it before and you know even if you've not been a person who ever thought you'd have kids I never really considered wanting children or like I was it wasn't a thing, you know, it's like, but then you have, you have your child and they are, they are the all, they are the gravity mm -hmm. of life. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if that's been said in magic and um, or that particular idea has been thought of, but I like very much the idea of bringing that to the conversation within the game because mm -hmm. there really is bigger power than love. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's now look at um, the other piece by Elliot. Yeah. Uh, so uh, obviously this, is, this isn't this is your piece, but you, you talked about it, it playing nicely into yours. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, we both developed our own ideas separately without showing them to each other. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I had very little hand in any part of their idea, which is incredible. And so I ended up doing this this, this uh, dragon related um, battle struggle, protective struggle. And they ended up doing this kind of powerful piece that is in conversation and, and a sort of taming of a dragon. Hmm. And it was, a lo and I was just sort of, my heart felt incredible seeing it. It felt like, you know, we as parents want so much to give our kids the strength inside to journey journey well and and the fact that they came forward with this sketch that you know i was in a struggle for something and they were in control of that thing mm. and and in union with it and it was it was so beautiful to see it i was really moved when i saw it yeah. When when in the process did you get to see it? Not until they were pretty far along. Um, they did a really detailed drawing that they submitted mm -hmm. to Tom separately uh, to, uh, for approvals. And uh, and that's at the point at which I saw it. And then um, they went to watercolor and did the watercolor entirely themselves. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I watercolor was I think it's kind of ironic that watercolor is where I started as an artist and they chose that as the medium that they wanted to use you know and, and they've always been incredibly independent minded uh, you know mm -hmm. you don't you really think you know that artists living together are going to have a lot of influence over each other but not necessarily you know it's like <laughs> it is very much an independent person and so they chose the mediums they chose the the methods they, they they've been doing ink work for a long time they spent a year at art school ahead of this mm -hmm. and exploring a lot of uh drawing and, and ink work um mm -hmm. and so they just kind of went into the things that they most wanted to use for the piece um okay yeah and and for those who are just seeing uh, Elliot's work for the first time, are there other places that they can see um, their work? Other other books, other games, comics, anything like that? No, I you know they 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 do um, have a, a pretty uh, active um, TikTok. They have a lot of followers on TikTok, <laughs> but I don't know their handle because they won't tell it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure our enterprising fans can figure it out. <laughs> I'm sure I can figure it out, but I feel like I have to honor their privacy. Uh, mm -hmm. They can be found on Instagram at Bootleg Ghost. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, yeah. I think that and in, in terms of where they are, in terms of more publishing work, they're, they're just going to, they're going to art school again in the fall. They're going to go deep into okay. their own thing. Right now they're really into installation work and um, uh, narrative public sculpture. So mm -hmm. um, this thing that they, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, we accepted the invitation from uh, the, for the opportunity, uh, but it is mm -hmm. up to them whether or not they pursue it. You know, okay. Pursue publishing in general. Uh, yeah. Anymore. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, and, and what about you? Should we expect any more magic work from you in the near future? You know, this opportunity to do um, these uh, self-directed things is um, wonderful. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure how much more I could say. If I am involved in anything, it will be of similar parameters. Sure. <laughs> I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. self-directed, yep. similar parameters. <laughs> Makes sense. 
Um, so I did want to, um, because your, your art and your style is so distinctive in magic and, and so iconic, I did want to, uh, talk through some of your past pieces, uh, and, and give the, give chat the opportunity to maybe ask about some of these older pieces or, or as they've been doing just gush, which is kind of all chat has been, which is wonderful to see. Um, so we're going to look at some of your older pieces and talk through some of those. So let's start with Bitter Blossom. Let's put that up on the screen, a widely known card. Um, so yeah, tell us about this Bitter Blossom. Um, yeah, I, you know, it, it's funny with Bitter Blossom, I did not have any idea that this would be as powerful a card as it was going to be. Uh, when I got the, the commission to do it. Um, and this is also one of the, you know, you, you've got a couple others uh, in, in the, um, you know, of the images we went over that were earlier on pre-style guide. This was one of the kind of ones that was deep into the style guide years where I was trying really hard to um, find myself within style guide characters. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I felt like I could get my head around these particular characters. And again, I, you know, I'm really happy with that that little dude in the background and the gesture of the hands and the arm, um, and, and the sort of floating uh, moment of that fairy dude in the background. Um, and and whenever I can get a gesture right, that's when I'm happy. If I if hmm. I get a really fluid figurative gesture in a piece, I feel like I've brought something to it that is special. Um, and so. I was I was particularly happy around that. Um, you know, I, I I I quite dig the the baroque purple of it all too. <laughs> nice. Uh, the next card I want to talk about is a classic, uh, Gaia's Blessing, a long yeah. time tournament staple. It's been reprinted a bunch. Uh, again, iconic art. Tell us about this one. Yeah. It's a real favorite. It's really, I have a, I have like 10, 15 ones that really hit close to home. Um, and uh, I was sitting in a coffee shop in Amherst doing the sketch of it. And I, I found it recently when I mentioned those sketchbooks earlier that I found. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I can, I remember the moment in time sitting and having the coffee, drawing it out. The juxtaposition of the fragility of, of a, of a unclothed figure who is extremely gentle um, with this this very uh, you know literally hard armored figure um the protected figure um that was really lovely to me it just felt like um you know where the places meet uh was important like i remember a teacher in art school saying think about think about not a hand and a body think about the press of the flesh think about the weight of the Forms and the things mm -hmm. touch and where where edges are where things meet those are the important places and the the meeting of these two figures had such a sweet intimacy to it um it it, it was it was just it just felt so lovely um and mm -hmm. And I all figured out, again, about, back to the gesture of things, I figured out really early on that I was never going to be a, a, an effects artist. I was never going to be good at um, how much rim light I could put on something because I don't know how to paint that way. Um, and uh, what I do know how to do is give an emotional connection. And so, again, mm -hmm. when I've delivered that gesture, and an emotional connection happens between the, the, in, in the fluidity of gesture and the connectivity between two characters. Or, mm -hmm. or applied action of one. Um, mm -hmm. So these two figures and how they connected, it just it just hit on all the right moments. Yeah. All right. The next one we want to look at uh, another favorite of mine, Priest of Titania. So let's put that up on the screen. Uh, this is another one from back in the day. So tell us about Priest of Titania. So there's some things about Priest of Titania that I really like, and there's some things that I'm like, eh, could have done better. Uh, so largely, I think it's a, it's, it's a sweet card, and I have affection for it. I really like the priest character. The, the foreground figure is great. I really like these like strong graphic of the purple alum flowers. I wanted to use that close uh, depth of field stuff and looking through something. 
Um, mm -hmm. I like her the her gaze. I like the stylization of her figure. I like she's not like you know I was really into sort of broad stylization and a line shapes and and using these big shapes to anchor compositions. Where I would do it differently, could I? Was I'd make I'd do the figures in the background with more clean, distinct gesture. I'd figure out mm. exactly what they were doing. Um, I think I was trying to figure out what they were doing, but couldn't settle on something. But now I would. So mm. I still really like the piece. Uh, but but that's what I, I would actually do something differently if I had my brothers. Okay, that actually um, segues nicely. We'll, we'll, we'll get to one more piece in a second. But that segues nicely into a question I saw in chat, um, which is if you were able to redo any piece that you've done for magic uh yeah. what would you want to redo <laughs> it's really going to be hard to do this without dissing it but <laughs> <laughs> i would totally totally redo dark ritual really <laughs> yeah <laughs> you, I would, you're definitely I would, disappointing someone in the chat who earlier said your dark ritual was the best dark ritual thank you i will take it and i am happy <laughs> Uh, but I think I could have done it better. It's just that I didn't have the confidence at the time to ask for different, ask for changes in what they were expecting in the art notes. Uh, I knew when the art notes came in that I, I wasn't like, again, I'm not an effects person. Like I'm not a big wild magic effects person. I don't do it very well. And mm -hmm. the description didn't feel like it really fit my wheelhouse. But I tried. I'm always going to like try to bring myself to something as best I can. But I always thought, well, if I, could do, if I went back to it, I would, I would do some things differently. That being said, I, I am thrilled that, that it's hit some people. And, and, and I don't want to take anything away from that. Um, but, but, uh, but, but I bet you'd really dig my like new dark original. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's uh, look at one more piece of yours from the past, and then we're going to get to Q and A. So, I've been writing down questions, everyone from chat. If you have more questions, go ahead and put them in. Uh, but let's talk about one more piece that was actually recently reprinted: Enchantress's Presence. Nice, cool. Yeah, actually, that's. Uh, let me see. I was just showing this earlier when we were showing the sketchbooks, and this might be kind of a nice thing to show. And I was mentioning that I, I ran into these sketchbooks that I had in storage, and I, I, it, it, it had about fifty sketches that I hadn't thought I still had. And one of them was en Enchantress's presence. So that's the original sketch of that, and it's in yeah, this sketchbook, incredible. full of everything. And so, um, like, there's like some white wolf stuff in there <laughs> and, uh, and then uh those are some wild it's like this crazy little time capsule <laughs> uh, oh yeah and, and like and there's uh sam white sam white master the italia mm -hmm. very um, cool yeah um so yeah that was an interesting piece i was shifting to uh from watercolor to doing more opaques with acrylic wash then and i was getting a little bit more into sort of atmospheric effects and so, so i was really particularly happy about like the the opacity of the, the sort of twilight sky back there i remember that a lot and and thinking um boy i i really like the the effects of opaque paint and uh so i, re I remember those successes a lot in this piece and I was kind of gearing up to a shift to um, just doing a little bit more opaque layers and with transparent glazing, which was also a, a, a result of shifting from being purely watercolor to uh, acrylic gouache. And then I shifted from acry acrylic gouache to uh, oil. Um, and so this was this was one of those pieces that was at the beginning of it. I was kind of trying to find my footing in, in um, going into the water house a little bit of water house influence and and and, and stuff that i hadn't quite hit yet uh in mm -hmm. my past and i came into uh fantasy art with a, a an influence from like uh, edmund dulac and uh rackham and uh kay nielsen and um and and sort of a slightly more whimsical um transparent 
line work based artists from the turn of the century and then that the shift to opaque paint opened up the door to kind of looking more at um you know uh, like waterhouse and rossetti and and uh nc wyeth and, and and more opaque painters a little bit more um which uh have led to other things uh so. very interesting all right, I want to use, we've got about 20 minutes left, and we've got some good questions in chat. So I want to pose these to the both of you. Uh, I, I saw an interesting question put in here multiple times in a couple different ways, and I think it's a great question for this stream especially. Um, so uh, you're both iconic magic artists with a lot of work in the game. Do you have favorite pieces of each other's? Um, and which piece and why? I can start That's off. A- I always like Bitter Blossom. Bitter Blossom, the colors just just shout at you. And, and a subdued shout. It's it's just a wonderful composition. The colors are wonderful in that piece. And yeah, there you go. Just rich. <laughs> well, you know, when somebody has a long career and they, they've had uh, you know, so much magic work, it's kind of hard to pick out. Into, I mean, if, if you ask me favorites of almost all of my colleagues, it'd be really hard to pick out one. But um, I have to say that um, I, you know, I the, the, the two new pieces that you have in the new set, I love that um, the one with the tree, the balance piece. I think that is just, just fantastic. So I tend to like everybody's new explorations anyway. So. Yeah. Same, same here. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's let's stick in the um, patting other artists on the back because we got a bunch of these kinds of questions. Uh, are there any magic artists uh, other than the ones mm-hmm. on this stream who you particularly enjoy or find compelling? Yeah. So many, you know, there's, there's yeah. been so many. Uh, I am just a huge and forever Adam Rex fan. Um, just bananas, brilliant. Um, I mean, so many, I have so many friends, like, you know, and so many people whose work I love, Donato, uh, you know, Scott Fisher, um, like, there's just so many. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. There's too many and there's a lot of good art, uh, and a lot of them are friends. You know, we know a lot of people and we've grown up with people or we do a lot of shows. So we get, you know, the context. So it's, it's almost hard to pick a favorite yeah. or even a top 10. It'd be very hard to, to, to do. So. I think Elena Danner knocked it out of the park uh, with her dual Lotus. I think oh, Seth yeah. McKinnon is, is pretty great. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, Tyler Jacobson. He's just, yeah, Tyler's killing it too. Tyler Jacobson's just doing mm-hmm. some wonderful stuff too. So. Yeah. Great. Um. Next up, let's see. That that kind of just answered the question. Um. Now we'll switch to other cards. So what um, are there any cards that you didn't do the art for that you would love a chance to do the art for? I kind of did with the uh, with this new set as far as the Mm -hmm. um, brainstorm. Uh, I mean, there's always cool old cards you'd love to go back and tackle and stuff, but uh, I kind of got a chance to do that. I'd love to revisit birds one day or something, make it something totally different, but I I don't know. Fair enough. Rebecca? I I have no idea. (laughs) I really, I don't, I have no idea. I I don't, I, I, I have no idea. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, Another question for both of you. Uh, Is there a piece of art that you've done for magic uh, that you think is relatively underappreciated? Something you really enjoy that maybe hasn't been noticed as much by the community? Uh, That's, I mean, 
I can go back to the original set, maybe. Um, back then, I did one called Natural Selection, and that was really cool. The Egyptian themed bird head guy with a hole in the red orb. Mm. I like the 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 colors on that piece, but the card was just never used. And you know, when you're young, it was your first set. You're like, but no one ever played that card. I never signed that card, so it was always kind of like, mm -hmm. oh, but I like I kind of <laughs> like the art, you know. So that was that would probably be one up the top of my head. I would think of, yeah. All right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I always, I feel like it's like my whole life with this, it feels like it's been an embarrassment of riches. I just kind of so dang grateful <laughs> for like anything ever, anyone's oh, yeah. ever liked. Like, I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> like all of this yeah. isn't enough? Like, <laughs> like I've been so happy like, when people have appreciated it all. And, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I could. Yeah. Yeah, you fair, do. Fair you enough. do get one. You get that one fan. Like an old car was junk. It's a really wonky card. But there's this guy in Texas who walked up with like binders of junk cards, just binders. That was <laughs> what he focused on, and that's what he collected. And I was like, oh, okay, that's right. that's that's pretty right. cool. <laughs> you just never mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, okay. So here, here's an easy one. Um, what are the primary mediums you use? And we'll start with you, Rebecca. Well, these days it's mostly oil. Yeah, but I am shifting to a new body of work that's a kind of totally different medium. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, 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 I've shifted a lot. I started as a watercolorist uh, mm -hmm. and then shifted to acrylic gouache and then shifted to oil almost exclusively. And now I'm, I'm, I'm shifting into something else. Uh, I do a lot of monotypes too. Um, for magic, uh, it's largely there have been watercolor or acrylic or oil. Uh, this one's in oil, it's the new one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right, Mark? Yeah, uh, some of the old stuff was acrylic, airbrush, acrylic, maybe some um, colored pencils, but not much of that. And over the years, it stayed acrylic because of the, the speed of which they would dry. But most times, uh, lately, it's oil, maybe over an acrylic, a, like an acrylic wash-in that I'll go back in. Or even sometimes, I'll still do a little bit of airbrushing. just depends on the piece or if the sky needs it or something. But it's pretty much oil because I can still get the same gradients with oil as I can with an airbrush. So I, mm -hmm. I'd say mostly oil now. All right. Uh, next up, we have a couple requests for some individual card stories. So let's see if you can remember the stories behind these. I, I don't think producer Sean can work magic. I don't think he's going to be able to pull these up quickly. He might surprise us and be able to get them up. Um, Mark, let's start with you because I think this one's going to be easier. Um, the story behind uh, the question was, Mark, can you tell the story being told in Ancestral Recall? I've always found it mysterious. Yeah, it is kind of mysterious. I remember, again, I got the assignment and I just picked off a lot of things like the letter A. So I picked off, checked off Ancestral Recall, blah, blah. But then I had to sit and go, well, what, what's an Ancestral Recall? What, what does it do? What's it supposed to convey? Again, I didn't know what the card did in the game. Um, so I'm sitting going, all right, let's uh, work some things out. So I imagine the guy thinking about his ancestral DNA might have been Mayan or Aztec or mm -hmm. something from that line. So um, at the same time, I think I was at, at uh, Epcot and eating at the Mexican place is my favorite place to go to. They have a big, it looks like a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nighttime scene and you get the, you get the uh, temple in the background. So that kind of influenced my whole thing. So I said, let's um, let's just make it a Mayan-based guy thinking back through his DNA history. So it's kind of weird. All right. There we go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, compared to this next question, that one was low-hanging fruit, Rebecca. Uh, <laughs> let, let's see if you remember this one. Can we hear Rebecca talk about the funny story behind Persecute Artist? from the unset classic <laughs> remember that one oh yeah yeah 
So yeah, uh, it's, it, I told this story a number of times. Uh, and it's funny that people still haven't heard it, but it, I'll go ahead and tell it again. Uh, so yeah, it's. Uh, I thought a lot about it recently and how it all unfolded. And this is all pre, pre-internet, pre, you know, pre-Facebook, pre-social media. Mm-hmm. So it's incredible that it all unfolded the way it did, even without without um, internet. Uh, but I, I've been working for a number of years with Magic and and uh, a freelance artist, you know. And and I uh, was talking to the new art director when a new release was coming out. And I said, well, you know, uh, we're not going to be using you in the new set. Uh, it's just going in a different direction, a little bit more kind of, you know, masculine and a little more uh, pumped up, you know, uh, and, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, <laughs> all right, you know, it's like not the first time I've been told, you know, we're not going to use your work in a, a set, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I was a freelance artist, uh, uh, you know, I've been told a number of times through my career in comics, and you know, so, well, you know, you're not ready for this, for this reason, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's too feminine, or it's too, you know, fairy tale or it's too classical or you know it just it just uh, all, any number of things and so so okay i was disappointed because at that point it was kind of an important part of you know uh being my freelance landscape but that's the choice you make when you freelance um and so about six months later maybe a year later i got called by an organizer down in florida who i'd done a number of events with for signings and he said, can you come for this, oh, the, the launch of a new set? And I was like, well, I, I'm not in it. Um, and he said, why? And he said, well, they're not using my work anymore. It's too, you know, it's too gentle. It's too, um, it's too, you know, romantic, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then I really didn't think about it, <laughs> like at all. <laughs> I didn't think about it at all. And then I don't even remember what the timeline was after that. I don't, I've lost track of how long things were, but like maybe it was a few weeks later, maybe it was a few days. I honestly can't remember when I got a call from the art director. He's like, what did you do? I'm like, I didn't do anything. He said, we can't open our emails. We can't like nobody, like the whole system is is flooded with emails about like, why is why aren't you using Rebecca? <laughs> oh no, I swear to God, he was, he was really upset. And I was like, I swear to you. And I told him, Exactly the same thing that mm-hmm. I talked to this where I said exactly what you told me. I was not upset. <laughs> this is just the thing. Mm-hmm. I'm not in it because of these reasons. That's it. But mm-hmm. um, so things settled down, um, which is great. Uh, uh, but in the end, they asked me to come back uh, to do this card that was kind of a joke on the whole thing uh, and, mm-hmm. and the, the, the sort of, you know, I think none of us were really expecting, but when I look back on it now, I mean, I was, I was flattered at the time to be champion. Uh, mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting, I didn't seed any rebellions. It was just, you know, but I was flattered to be champion. And I think one of the things that it said, uh, and this is just my opinion is that there was a hunger for different perspectives that were that was a piece of what I brought to the table as an artist. Mm-hmm. And what it said to me is, I didn't want that piece to go away. Yeah. And, and, and I think diversity is a point. And I think that a diverse perspective speaks. It, it's a very, very good thing. And so I think that the, the voice that the voices that rose up that said, we want this, uh, I think I think perhaps was a formative thing in how the game went forward from there, because this mm. was sort of at a pivotal point of, you know, and I could get a lot of things wrong here. So, you know, I'm just a human doing my best to explain shit stuff. So, um, <laughs> and so I think that it was right after Hasbro had bought, um, bought the company and they mm-hmm. were uh, going in a certain direction. And I think it made, them think well maybe maybe we expand the direction a little bit maybe we are we don't just think because it's going to be a, a, 
like a fantasy game that it has to be hard fantasy that it has to be mm-hmm. like you know it can have a breadth to it and speak to many people um so mm-hmm. i think largely it's a really uh, an important moment in time perhaps mm-hmm. yeah all right. Well, we are just about out of time. So uh, I'm going to start by thanking both of you so much for coming on uh, and, and sharing all these stories with us. Uh, chat was just gushing about both of you. So we're very lucky that uh, to have you on, to have you doing Art for Magic. And so we very much appreciate that. Um, before we go, uh, why don't you tell people, uh, is there anything you're working on right now, anything coming up, if they enjoy your art, um, where should they look for you? Let's let's start with you, Mark. Yeah, but it's always some new, some cool new magic things coming up, working on, so that's always exciting. I'm starting now after the, I've been stuck in my dungeon for COVID, so it's survived all that, but I've been working on some personal stuff or gallery side stuff, which will probably be at uh, a LuxCon coming up this year. Um, but I've just finally, re- after many years, I finally got my website back up and changed. So it's, it's up at markpool.com. But other than mm-hmm. that, just drawing, sketching and, you know, breathing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rebecca, how about you? Um, so I'm, I'm just, I've been spending the last several months fulfilling the Kickstarter that we did, that I did last, last fall. Thank you everybody so much for supporting it. If you supported it, I'm just deeply grateful and, uh, and continuing to work. We just got a bunch of stuff in where, um, for the, for our large prints. Um, so we'll continue all summer, just shipping out stuff and getting in play mats and shipping out play mats. And that's a lot. Um, and then I found out, uh, I just posted about it recently, I, but I found out today that this, this image is going to be included in the Lunar, Co- Lunar Codex, which is um, an archive of uh, art going to the moon um, for uh, mm-hmm. time caps placement. Um, and I'm one of a group of artists who is the first group of women artists to be represented in a lunar time capsule. And they confirmed today that they're going to use this one as a representative piece. So it's that's, that's very cool. Yeah, I'm so excited. I kind of can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, just find me on Instagram. Yeah. All right. Well, again, thank you both. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll be back next week on Weekly MTG. I won't be here, uh, but we will be here talking about Adventures in the Forgotten Realm. So don't miss that show. And we will see you next week. <laughs>